I mean, imagine a client experience where you never talk to your lawyer, uh, you never meet them in person. Maybe you talk to them twice over a eight month, nine month time period in the span of your case. And then the call you get from them is you need to settle your case. And if you don't settle your case, we're withdrawing. I mean, imagine that. Uh, contrast that with coming to a firm you know, like ours and how we approach it, where attorneys involved from the beginning, attorneys updating them on what's going on, giving, giving them an overview of the process. It's a very different experience for the client. And, and ultimately, it, it, it leads to more satisfied clients who are happy with, uh, with the firm and with their result. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Answering Legal's Everything Except the Law podcast. I am your host, Nick Worker. If this is your first time tuning in, this is the podcast where we share expert advice on all the parts of running a law firm that attorneys weren't exactly trained for back in law school. Now, today on the podcast, we'll be speaking with one of Georgia's most esteemed trial attorneys. Our guest has helped over uh, obtain over $70 million in injury cases and has been consistently selected as a top 100 trial lawyer in the state. His firm has also done a standout job when it comes to serving clients and providing them with a great client experience, which is something we'll be discussing a lot in this interview. Darl Champion of the Champion Firm is here with me now. Uh, Darl, thanks for making some time for us. Thanks for having us, Nick. So, uh, well, first of all, my pleasure. Um, but can you tell our, our audience a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. So um, I'm originally from uh, North Carolina, came to Georgia to go to law school at Mercer, um, Thought I wanted to be a criminal defense attorney, uh, spent a year working at the DA's office during law school and realized that it, that I didn't think a career in uh, criminal defense practice was for me. So I sort of uh, pivoted and focused more on plaintiff's uh, personal injury law. I got a job my last year of law school working at a really well-established plaintiff's firm down in, in Macon and just really loved it. Uh, and that was kind of my long-term goal was to get in that type of firm that worked on catastrophic injury and wrongful death cases. Um, after law school, I spent two years clerking for a federal judge in Macon in the Middle District of Georgia. After that, I had a brief uh, detour away from the focus of working at a plaintiff's firm and worked at a defense firm. Uh, my intent was to work there for several years make some money and then either go out on my own or go work at a plaintiff's firm and also get some experience, try and get like that inside view of what it's like on the defense side and how insurance companies are evaluating cases. Um, and I, I knew I wouldn't like it long term. I didn't realize how quickly I would grow dissatisfied. Um, if, a, if the right opportunity had come along my second day there, I probably would have taken it. Wow. Um, so about six months into my tenure there as, a, as an associate, um, a friend of mine I went to law school with, so there's a trial lawyer in Atlanta named Michael Warshower. He's a very uh, well-established trial lawyer, very successful, um, excellent reputation, and uh, said he's hiring. Well, I knew the name because he had a case before Judge Lawson, the, the judge I clerked for in the middle district. And um, actually it, that case went to trial and I was the law clerk that was there and had a lot of interaction with the attorney. So I reached out to him, got the job, worked there four years uh, and then went out on my own in, uh, I think it was July 1st, 2014. So we'll be eight years this July. Um, and it's been uh, it's been an interesting, interesting ride. And I'm, I'm sure we'll talk a lot about that today. And Kind of some of the things that I've learned, and uh, a lot of it's just been through a lot of the mistakes that I've made. Well, I I I know that mistakes are are sort of the best teacher, unfortunately, um, mm -hmm. and I, I know that from uh, from personal experience too. Um, but you've been working in law, obviously, um, for for I don't want to date you, but but a little while now. Um, have you yeah. sort of seen the expectations of clients evolve at all since you first started practicing? Um, are they expecting more from law firms in terms of the experience that they're being offered now, as opposed to like, you know, uh, a, a few years ago? That's a great question. So um, some of my view is skewed based on the type of firm that I've worked at. So um, when I was in law school, I was working on a firm that was uh, at a firm that was very selective, had a very high threshold for the cases they were going to take. And then kind of the same thing um, when I worked at uh, the Warshower firm here in Atlanta. And so 
I think there's a different expectation based on the type of case, period. And, and, and we can talk a little bit about that and, and what I mean by that. But I think on the whole, though, what I've seen just in the coming up on, it'll be eight years this July since I started my firm, but I've been practicing. So I started the defense firm in 2009, started at the other plaintiff's firm in 2010. So 12 years as a plaintiff's lawyer, almost eight on my own. I've noticed um, a, a little bit of a difference in the last uh, eight years. Um, I think some. Uh, I, I think sometimes there's more of a uh, interest in getting things resolved quicker. Um, but I, I think that's always kind of been there to some extent that you know people just aren't necessarily patient with the, the case process because sometimes if you're going to work a case up for trial. Uh, it can take several years to get there. That's what I mean when I was saying there's a difference in the type of firm. You know, if we were at a firm where um, that was all we did, and, you know, right now we have those kinds of cases, but we're, you know, I, I always refer to us as a full service a general personal injury practice. We have everything from the large multi million dollar wrongful death cases to the routine car wreck cases. And I think what I've seen is, you know, expectations vary more across the different types of cases, depending on the type of the case, the severity of the injury, that kind of thing. Um, but on the whole, I think, um, you know, the legal industry in general, ex especially the consumer-based uh, legal industry, so representing individuals, whether it's criminal defense, family law, personal injury, whatever, um, I, I think the hurdle has always been really low um, in terms of the what other firms have set for client expectations because you know historically i mean a lot of what i would refer to as the old school lawyers it was i'm the lawyer i'm working on your case don't bother me we'll get done when we get done kind of thing um and i think people uh, i think there's been a definite shift towards people wanting to have more control more knowledge of what's going on in their cases um in addition to there i, I do think there's a a desire to have things resolved quicker. That's interesting. And it's so funny because uh, it feels like when, when like the business of law firms kind of got industrialized um, like a decade or two ago and people were taking on advisors and business coaches and, and, and really bringing like the practice of business to law firms, which is a good thing. Uh, it's like you said, like the hurdle in the bar was set so low that simple things like, be nice to your clients when they call you um, could improve your rep reputation so much that like you could get more referrals from people who just had a good experience with you and, and, and knew others that might need your help. Um, but I'm curious, what do you think are the major differences in the expectations of like different types of cases that you see? Well, I, I think, um, you know, on the whole, I think there's a general expectation among people that, um, the more catastrophic or the more serious something is, the more it's going to be fought. Um, it may depend, though. I mean, obviously, if, if it was a straightforward, clear liability car accident and there was a death involved and there was only a million dollars in insurance, for example, I think there's an expectation that the case should get resolved quickly. Um, but when you're dealing with large companies um, that, that have larger insurance policies or a, a whether if they're self-insured, just a more ability to pay kind of whatever the damages are, there's an expectation that, you know, to get full value, you're going to have to fight it out because they're not going to roll over easy. Um, same thing with medical malpractice cases. We do a fair amount of med mal cases. And, you know, I've never felt, you know, this sensation that, uh, uh, that a client's felt and this desire to get the case resolved quickly. They know the issues involved. They know why the medical providers um, that are being sued aren't willing to settle the case and you know what's going on there. You know, sometimes, and this isn't always true, but um, you know, I've heard this a lot when I talk to my friends about it and other colleagues that sometimes it's the smaller cases that lead to more demanding clients um, and the ones with the more catastrophic injuries just kind of leave you alone. Uh, I, you know, I don't know that that's necessarily true. Some of it may be perception uh, just because if you've got just a couple cases where the clients really, um, you know, being difficult or, uh, you know, what some lawyers may consider as being needy, 
then that may just kind of stick out and clouds your view of all the cases. Um, but I think a lot of it comes back to setting client expectations, though, in terms of what are they expecting at the beginning of the case, because they don't know. They've, you know, for most people, they've never been involved in this process. Sometimes if they have been involved in the process, that can actually be worse um, because maybe they had like a clear one of those clear liability cases where it was clearly a policy limits case and they got, you know, in a car wreck, let's say twenty five thousand dollars. Well, they may not understand why a case with a larger insurance policy and maybe more significant injuries is going to take longer. So it really is important to set the client expectations at the very beginning, regardless of the size of the case or the type of the case. I, I always, I, I can't agree with you more. So um, people don't want to be left in the dark, especially in like the information age. Everybody is so used to immediacy. Um which, which also comes in, in, in to the factor that like when they call your office, they want to speak to you immediately, which is a separate issue. Um, but I, I always, when I, whenever somebody asks me my opinion on what's the most important part of like the client journey is I say, bring them along for the ride. You know, they, they don't have to be told every single detail and hey, this is the technical motion that I filed and this is why... They don't need to know that, but like the updates and the, Hey, we're going to meet, uh, we're going to, we're, we're going to this proceed. I, I don't know the law. I can't even possibly tell you, you know, but like the big milestones, tell them what's going on with their case. Right. Um, and the, and the expectations is a big thing, especially like you have so much experience. You can say that with this policy, uh, with this type of injury and this, uh, particular insurance company, I, I estimate based on my experience that it's going to take two years to resolve, or it's going to take longer, or it's going to take, it's going to be a really quick turnaround. This company really likes to settle. Um, mm -hmm. But just the whole, pro the whole part of leaving clients in the dark just never makes any sense to me. So um, it, I I'll, I'll phrase it this way. Um, can you tell us more about your firm's approach on working with clients and what you've done to make the experience like what we're talking about, like bring them along for the ride and, and setting proper expectations so that you have the proper boundaries to do your job. And they also have enough information where they don't feel like they're in the dark. Sure. So, you know, a lot of this has changed in the age of COVID. And, you know, I would, I would hope um, that things will kind of go back to the old days at some point. Um, some of the things like, you know, Zoom meetings or, you know, telephone consults may, may just become more commonplace. Um, but originally, you know, what we used to do pre-COVID was, you know, I always emphasized a direct in-person meeting to sign up the case. Um, there were some exceptions. I mean, if the person was an hour away and it was a, a minor car wreck, you know, we may have sent them the paperwork to electronically to sign and that kind of thing. Um, you know, but nowadays, I would say the vast majority of new client contacts are, are handled through Zoom or telephone conference, um, our paperwork signed electronically. And um, again, there's some exceptions to that, though. Bigger cases, um, you know, it, it increases the importance, I think, for that in-person meeting. But I think having some contact and some interaction with an attorney early is important. Uh, I think it's one of the things that sets us apart from a lot of the large advertising firms where, you know, the lawyers got 200 cases and they may not ever, you know, they may not know the client and it's just a file number to them. And, you know, they may not get around to talking to the client until a month into the process. And when they do, it's literally just them reading some summary that somebody else wrote. So you know, for us, there's always some level of attorney involvement, regardless of the size of the case. And I think that's important to kind of get to know the client and to establish uh, that rapport with them. And that helps develop trust and confidence. And that's key for everything in the case uh, is to making sure that that they trust you and that they're, you know, that, that you're looking out for, for them and their interest and in doing those things. Then along the way, you know, one of the things that we always emphasize is keeping the client informed. I mean, some of some things are just natural, you know, in the progression of a case, like I need to call the client, and ask them about this. I need to tell them this. But there's also periods in a case where there's a lull, you know, uh, if it's before a lawsuit's filed and the client's still treating, you know, it's important to tell them at the beginning, you know, this is what 
the process is going to involve. You're going to need to get treatment. We'll touch base with you periodically, at least once a month, ask you how you're doing with your treatment. Um, if you need, have any questions in the meantime, you can call us and ask us about it. But until you get done with medical treatment, we can't settle your case because if we settle your case early, we can't go back later and ask for more money. Again, some exceptions to that, depending on insurance limits and that kind of thing. But um, you know, the bottom line is they need to know what's going on because you know, otherwise they're just going to the doctor. If they're going to the doctor for like the next six months and they never hear from their lawyer, they're wondering what's my lawyer doing or why isn't this case over yet? You know, they may not necessarily know that we can't settle their case until the case is over, until they're done with treatment, uh, unless we've told them that at the beginning. So again, setting the expectation at the beginning, we're, we're big on that, big on giving them an overview of the process, big on keeping them, uh, them updated as things go along. Then, you know, in litigation, there's a flurry of activity at the beginning. There's, you know, we got to answer discovery. So we've got to call them and get the answers. And then we've got to have their deposition. And we always meet with them and prepare them for it. And so there's a lot of interaction. And then again, there's a lull. And if you're just sitting around waiting for a trial date for a year or two years, it's important to talk to the client and let them know because if they just don't hear from you for two years, they just think that you're not doing your job. Um, when in reality, it may just be we're waiting on a trial date and, you know, we don't know when that will be. And that's that's also gotten worse. I mean, that's the other thing about the age of, of COVID is, you know, there was just a massive backlog from that original shutdown that, that there that existed in 2020 um, that has kind of affected everything. Uh, and, and I think we'll see, again, kind of going forward. I mean, even here in Cobb County, which is the county that my office is in, um, you know, jury trials were supposed to take place in January and those got put off because of the, you know, the Omicron variant. So, you know, some of the things are outside of our control, but it's important to tell the client everything you're doing that is within your control so they can know you're pushing the case on. Um, the other thing that, that we're big on is we do not strong arm our clients into taking a settlement with exception. I mean, I've definitely had cases where the maybe the client, it's, it's a bad case uh, from the standpoint of it, like it's not a good plaintiff's case, there's bad facts, maybe a prior injury, maybe they weren't forthcoming about a prior injury uh, and then got caught in a lie, you know, whatever, and they get an offer and it's like, you need to take this and here's why. Um, sometimes there's an offer, even if it's a really, really good facts, it's just so good. We tell them, hey, you'd, you'd really be wise to accept this and here's why. But the vast majority of the time, our approach to that is to let it be the client's decision. Because if you let it be their decision, they can't fault you for it. I mean, if you tell them this is their offer, here's the benefit. The benefit is, you know, the case is over. You don't have to go through this process. You know, I think this is low. I think they'll pay more money later. Even if they don't voluntarily, I think we could get you more money at trial. But there's always a risk. And you give them the pros and the cons and you let them make the choice and they don't feel like they're being strong armed into taking a settlement that they don't want to. And I think that's a big thing when you look at a lot of the advertising firms, I think that's pretty common just because of how big they are and how much volume they have. It's just get them in, get them out. And they need to do that to get their cases closed. And so they don't necessarily, they're not willing to say, hey, here's option A, option B or option C, and then let the client make the decision because they want that case closed. So. I think that's important. It, it also goes back to the trust thing. I mean, imagine a client experience where you never talk to your lawyer, uh, you never meet them in person. Maybe you talk to them twice over a eight month, nine month time period in the span of your case. And then the call you get from them is you need to settle your case. And if you don't settle your case, we're withdrawing. I mean, imagine that. Um, and that happens. And that's the experience for a lot of people. Uh, contrast that with coming to a firm, you know, like ours and how we approach it, where attorneys involved from the beginning, attorneys updating them on what's going on, giving, giving them an overview of the process and letting them make the decision, you know, again, option A, option B, we can go to litigation, we can file a lawsuit, here's the pros and cons, you make the decision. Um, it's a very different experience for the client and, and ultimately it, it, it leads to more satisfied clients who are happy with uh, with the firm and with their result. We will be right back with the show after this short message. 
who doesn't want to be a successful attorney with a busy practice but still have that life? Having those lunch breaks, playing golf, going on vacation, answering legal allows you to. My name is Laura Pfeiffer Battalora. I'm an attorney founding member of the Battalora Law Group. Our headquarters is in Brooklyn, but we represent people all over the state of New York. The process of getting started with answering legal couldn't have been easier. It was so seamless. They're so efficient. The message will pop up on my phone. It'll pop up in my email. Answering legal allows me to have a personal life, a more balanced life, and it also helps me to be a better attorney. It saves time, it helps you grow your practice without you even realizing it. Getting started with answering legal is the best thing that we've ever done. It pays off in spades. It's been amazing. I couldn't live without them, <laughs> really. From everything you're you're saying and and what I know about your firm after reading some of your reviews, it sounds like uh, that you you have the type of firm that's willing to go the extra mile for your clients to ensure that they have a good client experience with your firm. Um, can you talk about what some of those relationships um, have been like, or or some examples of clients that have really stood out? Uh, for you that you'd be able to share with us? Sure. So, um, you know, when, when I talk about the client experience, I mean, part of the client experience is just giving them a great result, you know, and that's just part of being competent, being diligent, being, you know, aggressive and doing what we need to do as the lawyers. But the other part of it are those touch points, like I told you about. I mean, again, imagine, I mean, imagine a case that's worth, let's just say $100,000, and they're at a firm where, you know, even if they do a good job and they're polite and professional, but they, they don't really, there's no touch points along the way. They're not getting updated. They don't know that that $100,000 settlement is good or not for the case, but they know how they felt about it at the end. Um, so we really emphasize that um, in terms of connecting with the clients, kind of understanding what's going on with them. Um, you know, we've, we get cases from a variety of sources. You know, when I first started my practice, it was stri almost strictly attorney referrals. Um, you know, and, but as we've at, you know, added cases and have former, more former clients, just because of the span of time and just the way, you know, the math works out, we've gotten more client referrals and, you know, we, we ended up with a case a couple of years ago, um, in 2020, I think the, it resolved in 2020 incident happened in 2019, but, um, you know, it was a catastrophic injury. It was a, a very bad car wreck. And it was a prior client that I had represented when I first started my practice in a very difficult uh, legal malpractice case that, you know, the vast majority of lawyers probably would not have taken just because the, the value wasn't there. And when you're dealing with any kind of malpractice case that people just have a really high artificial value threshold. And so, you know, we had done a good job on that case, developed a really good relationship with the client. And then it represented, you know, some of her family members in the ensuing years and her as well uh, in another uh, car wreck that was, you know, it, it, it was, a, I wouldn't use the term minor impact, but I mean, compared to what ultimately happened to her in this more significant wreck, it, it wasn't a large case. I mean, I forget what it settled for, but it was, um, you know, it was under $50,000. But she was in a, a very bad wreck. It was a DUI wreck. Guy was driving a company truck that had a $10 million insurance policy. And, you know, we were able to get that plus some additional insurance from other sources that we were able to identify. Um, and, you know, I attribute that exclusively to the job we did for the client previously, the relationship we built with the client. Um, and just, you know, again, not only doing a good job, but providing good client service and developing that trust so that when something bad did happen, you know, later, we were the ones that were looked to for advice and guidance. This is what I, I instantly love about you is um, I speak, I, I speak at, at, a, at a few events that go around. Um, and, and when COVID just started, I did a webinar with uh, a guy who owns a really big, it's like a coaching agency for, for law firms. And, uh, and we're, we're coaching people on like what you can do now that like courts are closed. You can't appear in court. What are you going to do? You, you're going to get new cases. Sure. But you, there's nothing to do. So right now is a, is a good time to get focused on your business process, your intake, upgrade your technology, really process, really like 
dig into what makes your firm stand out, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and we're talking about getting clients and uh, during a crisis. And I will, I'll, I talk about this all the time. I'm like a broken record, but uh, my experience, my experience, what are you going to do? Uh, this, this woman writes, you know, I love what you're saying. And I really want to do that, but I don't want to prey on people's fears. And, and, and here's why, here's why I like how you're explaining it is because there's no, there's no shame, right? You are genuinely, you have a skill uh, that you went to school for a long time for that you've practiced for a long time and you can help people get restitution for catastrophic events, right? Because we were talking to a lot of personal injury lawyers and criminal defense and bankruptcy and stuff, you know, stuff like that where people don't, it's not happy times, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no shame in helping people when you're genuine about your intent. Um, right. So if that's what you're worried about is like preying on people's fears then I, I charge you to do uh, like what the champion firm does is provide that that experience for your clients that's going to make them, I don't know, trust you more, um, mm -hmm. feel more positive about their case, feel like they understand what's going on, feel like they have the right expectations, that they're not just waiting around for a, a court date and they haven't heard from you for two years. Um, that's how you really help people. If you want to avoid feeling like you're preying on people's fears, then do, you know, take take the next step and do the stuff that we're talking about. Um, sorry, I, I went on a rant. <laughs> no, no, I, I think that's a great point. I mean, a lot of what I'm talking about, it it just makes sense from a business standpoint, um, just providing good customer service, but it's also just the right thing to do. I mean, you have people that have had something bad happen to them. I mean, even if it's a, you know, a relatively small car wreck case, you know, sometimes those are the most disruptive for certain people. I mean, they, they are living paycheck to paycheck. They miss a few days or weeks from work. Um, they they don't have a car. They need a rental car. You know, they've got some injuries, some medical bills, co-pays, deductibles. I mean, it could be a $15,000 case, but to them, I mean, it's very, very significant. It's a very significant event in their life. And I think giving them the due consideration and treating them, you know, appropriately, it's just the right thing to do to kind of know that, somebody actually cares for them and we're not just out there you know hey we're we're trying to make a buck off of you and you know i'll i'll bring up a couple points on that and that i think is a little bit different for for us um one is um and and if i can can I, i'd like to read a review for you um please Let's do that, that a client that I, that I think kind of is a great example of, of who we are, but a, a couple things. One, you know, a lot of lawyers won't help clients with property damage on a car wreck. They say, we're not getting paid for it. We're not helping you. To me, that's absolutely ridiculous. If you have a problem in your life, you're looking to hire an attorney to take care of everything, to help you for it. And handling property damage is sometimes a logistical nightmare with playing phone tag with people and doing all that. And, you know, but, for us, it's like, that's, it's just the right thing to do. And it makes sense. We're there to kind of help them through the process. The other thing has to go with attorney's fees. I mean, a lot of lawyers, and I mean, I've seen this are charging 40% to 45% for routine car wrecks, uh, sometimes 50% or more for premises liability and medical malpractice cases. Now, when you air this, this podcast and it's around forever, maybe by the time somebody's watching it, our rates will have changed. But, you know, for now, I mean, what we do, if it's a straightforward car wreck case, it's a third, 33 and a third percent. If it's a medical malpractice or premises liability, it's 40%. But the other thing for us is, you know, when we get contacted about a case, I've, I've heard a lot of lawyers that their criteria is, well, what's my average hourly rate going to be? And some of that's guesswork. They're trying to figure out how much work will I need to put into it? And what's my ultimate fee going to be? That makes perfect business, business sense. I mean, it really does. Because it's like, at the end of the day, I mean, we're not being contacted by a client who has money and can pay us up front or is going to pay us up front. Um, if they did, it's just easy. Hey, I'm going to charge you 250, 500 bucks an hour, whatever it is. And how much every time I spend on it is how much I get. So some lawyers try to kind of reverse engineer that and say, well, what's the case worth all this? And so they have this criteria. And so it's almost this kind of like, what's in it for me mentality. And again, I get that to some extent, because you're a business, you have to make money. If you can't, pay your bills and pay your employees, you're going to go out of business pretty quickly and not be able to help anybody. 
but you know there are some some limits to that and you know i've i've not looked at a case and tried to say what is my average hourly rate going to be i've never looked at that at all i mean what i've looked at is does the case have merit what are the challenges on the case what are what are the damages in terms of the ultimate outcome and you know there are certainly times with medical malpractice cases because those are so unique where you do really have to take into account the value of the case because just paying for experts and other things, you could outspend the value of it. Um, but this is a note we got from a client and, and this to me kind of validated, um, you know, why we do what we do. Uh, but she fell on another business's uh, property and it wasn't like she slipped on a banana pill or, you know, water inside a store. She like slipped outside on concrete and, you know, it was wet. And our argument was, you know, concrete's not supposed to be slippery when wet. It didn't have the proper friction on it. And, uh, but it was not a clear cut case. So, um, you know, we took the case and you know, got a settlement for, her and um, she said, this is the note, I'll read some of it. It said, I'd like to thank you and your entire firm for all your hard work throughout my case. Everyone I came in contact with was so kind and supportive and most of all, so professional. When I was first injured, I wasn't sure what to do. As you know, I called many law offices and all of them turned my case down. It was obvious they only wanted the easy ones. One of them referred me to you. And I'm so glad I called you because I was close to giving up. You took on the challenge and it was a big one compa compared to most slip and fall lawsuits, but you never gave up and I can't thank you enough for that. Um, and then she proceeds to say that she'll refer us to everyone she knows. Um, and I don't know if anything's ever gonna come of that. Um, and you know, to be quite honest with you, I don't care from the standpoint of I, I'm not doing those things because I'm trying to get her to impress her friends. It's something bad happened to her. We wanted to help her and we helped her. Whereas other people, it was like, yeah, I don't have time for this and it's not worth it. And, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, I think going back to the, what are the things that I think are a little bit different for us and, you know, how do we set that, you know, the, how do we um, structure our client experience? It, it really also just starts with kind of our core values and why we do what we do. Uh, sorry, I'm just a bobblehead right now because you're just, I'm just agreeing with you. Um, but, and, and that's what I, that, this is what I want to say to people who feel like in, in the, in their practice that they're preying on people's fears is you can go completely in the opposite direction and just try to help people and do it and do a good job. Some mm -hmm. cases you're right. Uh, obviously you could very quickly out, you know, outkick your coverage in a sense, um, for all my football fans out there, but, mm -hmm. uh, but not every case has to be a home run. If you're really looking to help people, then help people, you know, uh, set up a process by which you can bring your clients along and, uh, and, and start doing the, you know, do, do the right thing, right. Be a good person. Um, and a lot of that stuff will eventually affect your pocketbook. Um, I'm sure that, uh, whether, whether you, you know, like to admit it or not, but that, that review is so compelling to me. Um, and I'm sure to a lot of other people who eventually will read it that, uh, they'll say, you know what, I was going to go with that big firm that, you know, that has the TV ads, but I'm going to go with Darl Champion. I'm going to go with the champion firm because they seem like they really care about their clients. And they got this awesome result for this woman who, who wasn't even sure that she had a case because so many people had turned it down. Um, right. I do want to focus on this is um, your firm collects reviews. Um, and obviously you have such great candidates, but uh, is there a certain process that you have in place for following up with clients once you've finished with their case? It is good old fashioned asking them. I mean, we don't, the, uh, we've tried the review platforms in the past that make it kind of automated and we were not very successful in, mm -hmm. in that working out for us. Um, you know, I think if you're a, a really large advertising firm, just by sheer volume, um, you're gonna get enough to where it's gonna kind of build that up um, for us. You know, when we've tried that in the past, you know, a lot of it's going to their email and I don't, I can't remember the last time I checked my personal email um, and it's just kind of getting overlooked or people just aren't even paying close attention to it. So people aren't really, they're just not reading it. I mean, they're not even checking to see what it is. Um, maybe there's a program out there that's great that other uh, people have had success with. I've not run across that. To me, I found that the best way to get them is just by asking, just you know, hey, you know, when they're getting their settlement check, if you're doing it, you know, we, we, even in the age of COVID, we like to have a meeting with the client where they're actually meeting with the attorney, kind of give, this is your check. 
um, go over the settlement statement with them and uh, answer any questions they have. We'll ask them, you know, hey, we'd love for you to leave a review for us. Would you be willing to do that? And our marketing director sends them a, a link, uh, sometimes by text, sometimes text a little bit easier uh, because people get it on their phone and they see it right there. Uh, whereas email, again, it's just kind of being lost in the and getting buried in all the spam. And then if they don't, within a certain number of time, we you know may reach out again and ask. And you know, sometimes if it's somebody the attorney worked really closely with and has a good relationship with, the attorney will call. If the person maybe had a really really close relationship with the paralegal because they were interacting a lot more uh, for whatever reason, you know, then the paralegal will call. But um, you know, and then sometimes after that, you just don't get it. And I don't. You know, there's clients I know who have been very, very satisfied and sometimes just a year later, you know, it just magically appears. And yeah, I think the other thing, too, is especially the way Google set up. I mean, I think you've got to have a, a Gmail account to leave a review. So some people just may not. You know, they've got a Yahoo or whatever, you know, email account. They just don't get around to it. And, you know, they're they're looking for the easy way. And But that's the other thing. In addition to the ask, you've got to make it as easy for them as possible. Don't just say, hey, leave me a review and here's some options. Send them the actual link. So all they have to do is click on it. And so if you get a text and you get a link, all you do is click on it, boom, it pops up right there, type it in, leave the stars, you're done. See, that's the mindset that I really appreciate is you make it sound simple, right? Like we just ask our clients for reviews and they're, they're happy to give us reviews because we've worked really hard and, and we've, you know, mm -hmm. we've tried to be as personable as possible and, and this, but then it's followed up by action on your part, which is we make it really easy for them. We tell them exactly where we want the review. They say, text it to me. I'll text it to them. Email it to me. I'll email it to them. Oh, I don't know. Facebook message, whatever, you know, um, the, the important right. part is that you meet clients where they are. Um, and I'm, I, I say this all the time is that if a client wants a text message, you better be able to text. If a client wants a phone call, you better be able to call. If they want to come into your office, I understand with COVID, you might not want to do it or wear a mask or something like that, but there's, there's video chat. If they want to see you face to face, zoom is free. It's easy. Um, yep. and you better get acquainted with it if you don't want to get left behind. Um, so I want to ask you, cause I, I, I feel that this is going to be really paramount for, for lawyers who are, are, are like new to the game or have just like stepped out into, um, running their own practice is what is the one greatest piece of advice that you would give to them about interest, uh, interesting, interacting uh, with clients? That's a great question. Um, I, it's funny, I saw something on social media the other day, and it was like a step by step guide for how to talk to clients. And I remember thinking like, these things sound great, but if you got to tell somebody how to talk to somebody, it's like, that's going to be an awkward thing. It's kind of like, you know, dancing. Some people just ha are naturally, you know, have good rhythm. Other people can't, and they just need a lot of work. But watching somebody like have forced empathy, it's painful. It's almost worse than no empathy where there's no attempt. I, I think it is empathy. I mean, I think genuinely caring about people and wanting to do right by them. I, I don't think there is any way to necessarily teach that. And, you know, I think it comes through with the people that are in this, in the plaintiff's personal injury wor world for the wrong reason. I mean, I think there's, I call it my purity test. Uh, there's people on the defense side that want to come over and be plaintiff's lawyers because they think it's an easy way to make money. You know, they see all the checks that, that they're writing out, settling the cases, they go, it's just an easy way to make money. No, absolute wrong reason to do it. And in fact, when we put job listings out for associates, I specifically put in there, if you want to be a plaintiff's lawyer because you think it's an easy way to make money, you need not apply. It may be one of the reasons we don't get many job applications when we put attorney listings out, but I'd rather have people self-select that out. But, you know, for me, I mean, I grew up in a military town, Fayetteville, North Carolina, went to public schools. I got a job when I turned 16, working at a hardware store that also kind of interestingly also rented party equipment like the big inflatable bounce houses and other stuff, but also like lawn and garden equipment. It was like, a, it was a weird kind of setup. But uh, one of the things that we had to do was every time a, a customer walked in, we had to greet them and talk to them. And just the amount of interaction I had with people from all walks of life, again, military town, people from all different economic backgrounds, races, ethnicities, everything. 
um, just kind of understanding and getting to talk to people. And, and I genuinely liked it too, because I, I, again, I think this part of my human nature is to care about people and try to identify with them. I think the lessons I learned from that, you know, and just how to talk to people were invaluable. I think there's a lot of people that don't understand that because of maybe how they were brought up. Maybe they, you know, the schools they went to, they just haven't interacted with regular people. And I don't know the way to teach that, right? I mean, I think some of it's just, you either have empathy and care about people or you don't. But if you don't, you shouldn't be doing this period. Go work at a defense firm, fill some hours, go do something else. Don't come over to the plaintiff's side. I like that. Um, I have I have one addendum is that if you really do care about people, um, but you're just really awkward, um, like me, uh, you can probably find somebody who, who can work in your firm that can just be the customer service person uh, for you. And oh. like, you can kind of talk through them. Um, that doesn't mean you just hide in your office and and don't communicate with your clients. Um, but if you well, know that that's not your strong suit. Yeah, well, let me say something about that because I think that's a good point. I mean, I think there's um, a belief that, you know, the, the best lawyers are the ones that like get up in court and are smooth talking and this and that. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's the people who are genuine. Mm -hmm. And I think if you are awkward dealing with clients, but genuine, they're going to identify that and they're going to like you. I right. mean, people, want you to be yourself just be yourself and if you are yourself and you genuinely care about people that's going to come through and they're going to appreciate that and they're going to know that and honestly they would much prefer that over somebody who's you know may have better you know interpersonal skills but doesn't have that genuine empathy because again, I think that genuine empathy comes back to, I mean, some of it's just learning how to communicate with people and you can still just communicate horribly, right? I mean, just kind of awkwardly in terms of your mannerisms or whatever, but, but it's that genuineness. It's that genuine caring that comes out regardless of whether it's an awkward encounter or not. So, you know, I do think though, to your point on the intake front, that is where it really matters because there you're not there to set up a, 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 a trust relationship at that point, you're trying to convert the lead. Uh, it is really important to have somebody who does display genuine empathy, but also is, is able to efficiently talk to them and isn't going to be kind of stammering and awkward and, and that kind of thing, because that is that initial impression is what kind of gives them confidence about your firm. So when they call, that's important, but in terms of the long-term relationship, you know, I, I, I don't think it matters, um, you know, how skillful they are. I think it's that genuine empathy and caring and just knowing how to communicate with people. And again, that's not necessarily the method of delivery, but kind of identify, okay, what are their concerns? What are they worried about? Um, and actually listening to them and then answering them that, and providing them that information. What a concept, right? Um, right. So Darl, I, I'd like to thank you so much uh, for joining me on the show today. Um, and wanted to thank our listeners as well. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. Uh, we will be back with another episode of Everything Except the Law soon. Be sure to check out previous episodes of our show and check out the description for more on the Champion Firm. Uh, the show is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, and the Answering Legal YouTube channel. See you next time, everyone.